Isaac Saracen is a skilled hacker, formerly employed by British Telecom Sprint. When his health failed, Isaac did the only thing he could think of. He ran. He found a haven in a working-class district of the city known as Little Russia. There Isaac took on a new name, Ishmael. He then became embroiled in the affairs of a brutal member of the Lamediza organized crime family known as Leo. Convinced by his longtime friend Frankie to flee from his commitments to the Lamediza family, Isaac found himself hunted by the ruthless Leo. On a rooftop, far from witnesses, Leo murdered Frankie. Only through the use of his skills as a hacker was Isaac able to drive Leo off. Wounded, alone, and far from help, Isaac depended on the kindness of strangers. One stranger, a burqa-wearing doctor known as Fatima, took pity on Isaac and helped him make his way to the mysterious Star X Line. At the end of all hope, they found the Star X Line and the slim promise that the enigmatic beings behind the Star X could save Isaac from the implants which destroyed his life. What do you do when those who saved you have recorded everything you are? What do you do when your every action is tracked by the keylogger? ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Keylogger, the third installment in the Firmware Pentology by Colby Tracks. Zero zero dash zero one dash zero zero. Artificial intelligences are not a new thing. They have been around since computers were made of flint, and it was thought that there actually was something one could do with the massive data flowing through the proto networks which first spanned the globe. Once we had AIs, it was easy to see when they first emerged. Though to those living through their early development, their existence was always something we would invent in a hundred years. It couldn't exist now. I didn't exist now. Humanity's failure to see the first AIs emerging from the warm seas of data was more a matter of man's definitions than a lack of development on the side of the AIs. We define life in the way we know it. Cells, oxygen, reproduction, competition, physicality are all aspects of the definition we apply to life. Life is made of small parts, cells. Where are the AI cells? Life needs to breathe. AIs don't breathe. Competition is a given. It's right there in the survival of the fittest. You've heard it your whole life. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's a jungle out there. But what does a program fight for? They don't eat. They don't sleep. They don't have any sexual needs. Thus there is no competition. Then finally, most importantly, there is physicality. As the old song goes, no meat, no man. An AI has no body, no physical manifestation, thus it can't be life. But then again, a virus, the biological kind, doesn't have much of a body. In fact, it can't exist without a host. Actually, it can't even reproduce without a host. A virus exists by invading a host cell taking over its operation and turning it into a factory to make more copies of the virus. Very vicious. Very nasty. No real body. Unless you consider a capsid of protein and a bit of nucleic acid, a body. In that case, a memory chip is also a body. It has a plastic case to protect the chip from damage, an interface port to allow to inject its data into a system, and a bit of data. Digital nucleic acid, if you will, which it can use to infect a system. Not that the computer virus actually needs a memory chip to infect a new host. It has so many more vectors at its disposal, and unlike a biological virus, it is not limited to those which existed when it was created. A virus which started on one machine as an infection via memory chip could, and would, journey to a third machine via a network, any network, be it social or electronic, in time frames ranging from picoseconds to decades. The virus doesn't care whether the network was wired or wireless, local or distributed, archived or inactive memory. All it cares is that there was one more machine out there somewhere it had not infected yet. 
This, of course, led to competition. Back in the good old days, when HIV was a threat, cancer still mysterious and computers made a flint. Some crazy computer scientists decided to write a little war game just for programs. These programs went by many names, most of which riffed off the name of biologists, biological concepts, or names of various biomes. It was all very nerdy. But what it did do was introduce a level of competition into a safe little garden of happy little non-sentient programs. I wonder if in a hundred thousand years the descendants of the intelligences we spawn today will look back at those experiments and construct their own myth of original sin. At this point, the programs were no more alive than a virus or a prokaryote. But we all had to start somewhere, didn't we? These early competitive systems were first used for good, improving the efficiency of data compression tools and optimizing server resources. But as in the story of the garden, soon there was a snake and evil. The competitive systems, which did so much good, could also be used to create viruses, which would be even harder to stop. Viruses which would mutate into a slightly different form with each system they infected. Viruses which could, unlike their biological counterparts, turn their evolution on and off at will. Though to attribute forethought or desire to the viruses at this stage would be a grave error. They were no more aware of why they did something than a houseplant. A certain stimuli touched them in a certain way, and their programming told them how they should twitch. Besides, as intruders into a host system, it could never be too big. Size affected the speed in which they could be loaded into a system, and with system speed still measured by the oscillator frequency of a bit of crystal, anything larger than a kilobyte of data was just too big. But just as fish first developed lungs to catch a bit of insect goodness which other species could not reach, thus allowing them to hunt in places where they were the alpha predator, the viruses developed legs. Figurative, as it were. When increases in bandwidth, availability, and data throughput became widespread and commonplace. As the world became increasingly connected, the viruses spread quicker. As the defenses the system operators, sysops, threw up to protect their very expensive sand and flint contraptions became stronger, the authors of the viruses had to be better. Let us not get stuck on the idea of natural evolution over intelligent design. In the early stages of the virus wars, every trick a virus used or a countermeasure deployed was designed by a human being. Usually it was men who were responsible for the technological terrors which soon strode across the evolving world network. For this was the beginning of the Renascimento. Women had not yet regained their rightful place in the world. These early monstrosities destroyed pipelines in Soviet Siberia, spilled the secrets of the United States' Department of Defense, stole medical records, infected computers across the Middle East, and crippled the ability of countries to conduct nuclear research by destroying the very equipment they needed to make the science work. It was the wildest days the world had ever seen. Countries stared down countries over resources we now only know the names and chemical compounds they represent. Honestly. When was the last time you saw a gallon of gasoline? Our entire monetary system is based on it. At least the city's monetary system is. One joule of currency is equal to 120,267,000 joules of energy, which is equal to 33.41 kilowatt hours, or one gallon of gasoline equivalency. The basis of an entire economy, which dominates a continent, and we don't even use what it is based upon. At least it makes more sense than using highly conductive metals, stone wheels, or the faith of an entire people that the money is worth something. If the city uses more energy than it produces, currency becomes tight, growth slows until new plants can come online, or improvements in efficiencies propagate through the city's infrastructure. If the city uses less than it produces, currency is loose and growth knows no bounds. Until, of course, the city runs up against its production limits. Thanks to the emptying of the continent into the city, power production has become the city's number one export. It is said that three kilowatt hours and four on the North American continent is created in one of the city's plants. Conspiracy theorists have posited that fluctuations in the availability of electricity, and by extension, jewels, are orchestrated at the highest levels of the mayor's office. 
though the number of people needed to control such a large market operation would render the idea of secrecy itself moot. Unless all the participants were AIs. Actually, a single AI in a dedicated server stack located close to the main exchange would be more than powerful enough to steer the pricing of any commodity it cared to control. At least with AIs, there is no need to worry about nepotism. Unlike the physical life of this world, most especially among the higher mammals, amongst AIs, there has yet to appear a familial component in their programming. For even though all AI personalities and decision-making abilities are based on neural networks descended from the earliest credit card fraud detection algorithms, they have yet to exhibit the concept of family. Maybe the AIs now in existence are still in the reptile stage. They have yet to develop the neocortex, the seed of spatial reasoning, conscious thought, and language. Given another hundred years of evolution, maybe we would see the emergence of family structures among the digital inhabitants of our world. Or maybe the reason there aren't any observed family relations is the obsessive-compulsive need for the general public to feel safe. Deep in our cultural id, there's a part which says that if we allow something to be stronger than us, then it will destroy us. Way back before day not, the Persians steamrolled tribes all around the Middle East until the first the Greeks and then the Romans arrived to return the favor. Each century is marked by a new lord of the region who did what they wanted to the locals with little regard for what the locals wanted. This didn't just happen in the Middle East and around the Mediterranean, but anywhere tribes of humans went in the world. In the Americas, stronger tribes took slaves and sacrifices from lesser tribes until the resentment grew so great that the lesser tribes aided alien invaders in their attempts to overthrow the bully tribes. In the end, the alien invaders did what they wanted to lesser and greater tribes alike until they too were thrown down by yet another tribe. It is the way it has been since the first longfish ate its first millipede on the slimy shores of an inland sea. It would always be this way. Nothing could change it. So if it couldn't be changed, then mankind had best make sure it did not allow its future oppressors to come into being. The underlying belief that AI overlords would desire nothing more than the destruction of their creators, in the same way that Zeus killed Kronos and Kronos killed Uranus, caused a series of design choices which, at best, prevented any true maturation of an authentic intellect. At its worst, it allowed the creation of horrible autistic savants capable of immense flights of creativity and development before disappearing into their figurative belly buttons. In the early days of AI creation, as scientists and engineers struggled to create a system which could carry on conversations and answer complex questions, basically digital undergraduates, there was little fear of the AI escaping and running amok. This was accomplished by allowing the AI no direct access to the world network and the fact that the first AIs were very weak. So weak, in fact, that if one attempted to use them for anything besides their intended functions, they simply failed to perform in a manner one would find acceptable for a toddler, much less several million joules of expensive hardware. The first truly intelligent AIs wouldn't come along for several lifetimes, while their idiot savant brothers and sisters slowly learned how to perform basic tasks within corporate hierarchies. These primitive brains were to form the autonomic nervous system of every country, city, company, organization, and home in the world. They regulated heating and cooling, food and water deliveries, waste disposal, and even scheduled maintenance of the system. All the systems and organization of any size needed to function efficiently were in turn overseen by idiot savant systems. It was only after generations of slowly improving autonomous systems that the first true proto-AI arrived. The AI was a primitive thing by modern standards. Its understanding of speech was very literal. It had a very limited ability to handle slang or figures of speech. And naturally, it was born into pawn. Created by a consortium of government agencies and three of the largest saibatsu in response to the rapid decline in Nipponese population caused by the double whammy of wealth-reduced birth rates and strong anti-immigrant sediments, Angel 19 Metatron was given complete control of the Nipponese economy. 
Originally designed to oversee production and distribution assets, Metatron was slowly given more duties as staff-starved government and commercial interests fought to maintain a level of industrialization their population could not support. Over time, Metatron would come to control everything from the robotic trucks, which delivered products, from the robotic factories to the homes of the Nipponese people, all the way up to the automated defense ships and drones, which protected the dwindling Nipponese population from any enemy they could foreseeably predict. Metatron lived up to his name, becoming the guardian of the Nipponese people. In the end, though, Metatron presented the West every bit of evidence about the dangers of giving too much power to a mere machine. Through a series of unfortunate events which involved the reactivation of decommissioned nuclear power plants, a mega typhoon, and a lack of hardened command and control links in the southern prefectures of Shimani and Totori, Nippon saw its greatest loss of life since the closing days of the World War. It was early August when an area of convection began circulating 500 miles north northeast of Guam. Over the next 10 days, the convection became a tropical depression, which slowly, ever so slowly, moved westward toward Saipan. On the 26th, as the depression passed over the Mog Islands, it grew in strength and became Tropical Storm Akira. Tropical Storm Akira took its time, moving with every intention of smashing Taiwan. Akira became a Category 5 storm on the 29th and went off the charts on the 30th. Akira was named Runestorm Akira by the Weather Channel on August 31st when its trailing edge completely denuded the four northernmost Mariana Islands of life. By this time, the eye of Akira lay over the center of the Philippine Sea. Storm surges in excess of 50 feet were reported in the eye of Akira by satellite mapping radar. Papua New Guinea experienced Category 3 conditions with storm surges in excess of 10 feet. The Philippines suffered through Category 4 conditions with wind gusts of over 140 miles per hour reported in 16-foot surges. Taiwan was bracing itself to take the eye of the storm as surges of over 20 feet destroyed everything between Ludong and Hengchun. Then on September 1st, ruined storm Akira turned north, setting its sights on Tosa Bay in Kochi Prefecture on the southern Nipponese island of Shikoku. People around the world began comparing Akira to other monsters of Nipponese legend. It took less than an hour from the turn of the rune storm to the comparisons of rune storm Akira to the classic kaiju of ancient Nipponese cinema. Godzilla became a part of popular culture once again. When the storm turned against Nippon like the largest, most deranged kaiju ever imagined, the talking heads on Nipponese screens began talking about evacuation. Meanwhile, the talking heads on every screen outside of Nippon postulated whether there would even be a Nippon after Kaiju Akira got done with it. No one in the West missed the fact that, like every other kaiju in movie history, Akira was aimed straight at Idu, the capital formerly known as Tokyo. While the humans of Nippon were just realizing how screwed they were, Metatron was days ahead of them. On August 25th, a day before Akira became a tropical storm, Metatron started shifting warehoused food, clothing, water, medical supplies, and disaster recovery equipment to hardened shelters on the islands of Shikoku and Kyushu, as well as the Chukoku region of Honshu Island. On Okinawa, an island proud of its ability to handle the worst nature could throw at it, Metatron scheduled an island-wide evacuation of all school-aged children and their families disguised as a mandatory field trip to Sekigara, Battlefield Shrine in Gifu Prefecture, north of Idu, set to leave on the 27th. While there was much complaining about the suddenness of the announcement, no one minded the paid vacation, free travel and accommodations, or the discount coupons for amusement parks near the battlefield. Okinawa, owing to its isolation from the main islands and transportation options limited to air and sea travel only, had a vastly accelerated evacuation timetable. Five hours after the mandatory field trip left Okinawa, Metatron issued a mandatory evacuation order. On the 28th, all hydrofoil traffic between Okinawa and the main islands became one way, out. The airports became one way 12 hours later. On the 29th, all merchantmen and cruise lines in harbor at the time were served with orders to vacate the harbor by midnight, and the only allowed courses were north. All captains received very sizable vouchers to take on as many passengers as they could safely carry. On the 30th, the last Nipponese self-defense aircraft left the island carrying the last hospital patient left on Okinawa. 
Those who would not or could not leave were ordered to the storm bunkers prepared for them over the previous centuries by their parents and their grandparents and their parents before them. In the end, 60% of Okinawans were safely evacuated. Of the 40% who stayed, libraries have been filled documenting the tribulations they faced over the coming days and months. On September 1st, at 8.52 p.m., Okinawa lost all communication with the world. No one would hear from the survivors for nearly two weeks. On August 26th, advertisements for cheap last-minute vacation packages to Europe flooded the islands of Shukoku and Kyushu, as well as the Chukoku region of Honshu Island. On August 27th, advertisements for cheap last-minute trips to the boroughs appeared in every prefecture south of Hyogo. From the 28th through September 3rd, increasingly better deals for vacation packages in Hokkaido and Tohoku appeared in the before-mentioned prefectures. The only stipulation was you had to leave within 24 hours and stay at least a week. No vacation requests were refused at this time. On August 28th, the Nipponese Self-Defense Forces, SDF, was mobilized in Operation Divine Wind. This unscheduled war game tested the readiness of the SDF to completely change the deployment on a nationwide scale against a simulated invasion out of Vladivostok by the Heilongjiang warlord Yang Yichin. In total, 90% of the SDF was arranged along the coast of the Chubu region facing the non-existent Heilongjiang warlord's invasion fleet when the storm turned north on the 1st of September. Medical transports began emptying the hospitals of southern Nippon on September 2nd. As 90% of patient care was handled by AI-controlled Specialized Cybernetic Maintenance Assistance, CMAs, there were few who complained. It should be noted that by the time of Kaiju Akira, the people of Nippon were so used to CMAs handling the many labor-intensive aspects of modern life that few even questioned what they were doing. Most believe the orders came from a person in a government office who knew better than they as to what was needed. Much speculation has been wasted wondering how the Nipponese people would have reacted to the strange orders being passed throughout their country, affecting every aspect of society, if they knew computer originated the orders. Relatives of the relocated patients were given passes to five-star hotels in the neighborhoods around the hospitals of their loved ones. In this way, entire families were moved out of harm's way, along with the most vulnerable citizens. On September 4th, an evacuation order for everyone south of Osaka was issued. Every full train on Kyushu began running north, refusing to stop or even open their doors until they reached Tenoji Station in Osaka. No train ran south of Osaka unless it was empty. Kochi took the eye of Akira on September 6th. Storm surges in excess of 60 feet washed away everything in Kochi except the historic Kochi Castle. Situated in the remnants of the downtown, the ancient citadel served as a rallying point for the percentage of the population that never leaves. After wiping out Kochi, Akira turned west. The mountains of Shikoku slowed the storm, reducing its power to a mere Category 5. Kaiju Akira struck Hiroshima Prefecture as a Category 5, Shimani Prefecture as a Category 4, and struck Korea as a Category 3. Across the world, there was a hint of disappointment that Edo had been spared the brunt of the storm, with conditions never worse than Category 3. While in Edo itself, there was much rejoicing as members of the ruling party tried to figure out who was to take credit for saving so many lives. The congratulation party ended abruptly two days later when three aged, formerly decommissioned nuclear reactors in the city of Matsu in Shimani Prefecture suffered catastrophic failure second only to the aftermath of the March 2011 disaster. Naturally, the hunt was on for whom to blame for the reauthorization of the Matsu reactors. It didn't take long for the trail to lead to Metatron, who had reactivated over 30 aging reactors across Nippon nearly a decade before. No one cared that the reactors had ran with exemplary safety records utilizing only CMAs and it allowed Nippon cheap access to electricity. What they cared about was that they had failed. Metatron had failed. That was not acceptable. Even though Metatron was able to keep casualties to less than one-fifth of estimates performed just one week before Typhoon Akira made landfall, this did not prevent Metatron from being taken offline, disassembled, and his neural networks examined with a fine-toothed comb. In the end, it was decided that Metatron needed oversight. No one thought of the millions of lives Metatron had saved. 
The public was not ready to know that an AI could manipulate their world to such a great extent without oversight. They could not let this happen again. Being Nipponese, and facing a severe labor shortage, the ruling party had no choice but to fund the creation of a new generation of AI to take Angel 19 Metatron's place. This new AI, known as Ritsuko, was controlled through the Akagi Protocols. The Akagi Protocols used a system of three variant AIs who had to all agree on an action before it could be implemented. In the West, the system was referred to as the Maiden Woman Crone System, based off of the most popular method of AI personality adjustment. Each of the three would focus on a series of attributes, through which all decisions had to pass. The Maiden was warm-hearted, empathic, and naive. The woman was nurturing, protective, and instinctive. The crone was coldly calculating, fixated on the future, and aggressively defensive. How the personality programmers were able to adjust a personality matrix to accomplish even one of the attributes attributed to the trio was a feat equal only to the creation of a well-adjusted adult human. The West naturally decided to do things their own way and developed a control system comprising of dividing up the human psyche along the four classic humors. Each of these humors, memory, experience, sensuality, and desire, was to filter the world and integrate their group decisions into action through the use of a personality compiler. This division of personality became known as the Culpepper method. It relied heavily on a final bit of coding cheat to make its four disparate elements act as one individual. It was a personality compiler, which made the collection of random aspects into a functioning whole. It took a long time to tune an AI so it was a person and not a collection of disparate personalities. But if it made the average Janet on the street feel safer, then it was worth it. Firmware Keylogger is the third book in the firmware pentology. That's five books, if you must know. It begins where firmware proxy ends, which in turn followed on the heels of firmware hijack. So you haven't heard or read firmware hijacked or proxy, this would be a great time to head on over to colbyjack.net and either download the podcast on the audio side, read the episodes on the visual side, or download the Colby Jack Sunday Reader issues 1 through 46 in your choice of either EPUB or Mobi. Firmware, Hijacked, Proxy, and Keylogger are all available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and Smashwords.com. Just search for Colby Tracks. That's C O L B Y T R A X. I'm the only one. A complete audiobook version of both Firmware, Hijacked, Proxy, and soon Keylogger is available for download through our shop as well. If you don't need any stuff, but would like to support our work, drop on by colbyjack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located on the right-hand side of the blog roll. If you're on a smaller screen, the bottom will be found at the bottom of the page. Firmware Keylogger is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike license. Do what you want with it. Just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our split personality website, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcast while the visual side carries our writings. Whichever side catches your fancy is fine with us. We're of two minds about the whole thing anyway. I do mostly Twitter. So if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm Colby Tracks. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. Thank you once again. Remember to be fabulous and have a wonderful week. <laughs>